Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Citrix on Azure, Leading Practices and Lessons Learned. My name is Sarah Queen and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for our Services Portfolio here at Citrix. Today I'm joined by an all-star cast of cloud architects. Citrix Enterprise Architect Kevin Nardone will be leading the webinar. You may remember him from our hybrid cloud session back in October. We're also very excited to have with us today Microsoft Cloud Solutions Architect Jeff Mitchell. Before we get into the presentation, let me quickly review a few housekeeping details. We will have a live Q&A session toward the end of today's event, and you're welcome to submit your questions during the presentation. Simply type your question into the Ask a Question window and click Submit. Also, we are recording this event, and the on-demand version will be available from the same link that you used to join today. So feel free to come back, watch the archive, or share it with your colleagues. And finally, the slides are available for download from the Event Resources tab located along the top of the interface. All right, without further ado, let me go ahead and hand it over to Kevin to get us started. Kevin? Thank you, Sarah. And um, as we get started, the first thing I really want to cover is, is just some of the goals. What are, what are we going to learn today as Jeff and I walk through these lessons learned leading practices? First, we really wanted to start off and differentiate, you know, what's the primary ways you can deploy Citrix on Microsoft Azure? as well as go through after, you know, kind of highlighting those capabilities, you know, reviewing some key architectural considerations for deploying on Azure. And Jeff and I will kind of walk you through some core architecture tenants that we'd like to approach when we have these conversations with customers. And then lastly, uh, throughout the uh, overall webinar, we're going to share lessons learned. How do these, you know, what have we learned from the Citrix and Microsoft team working with customers moving towards the cloud? And you know, how these lessons learned, how do they relate to some of the key architecture tenants we're going to walk, uh, walk you through today? So starting off and just to kind of level set, you know, what is the enterprise cloud journey? I always love sitting down with customers and helping customers understand that moving to the cloud, it really is a process. It's not something that, you know, you need to approach a big bang. We need to kind of go through, throw everything on the cloud all at once. A lot of customers approach this in different phases. And I like to format the phase you know, these separate phases, you know, cloud builder, cloud consumer, and cloud broker. Uh, when you're a cloud builder, you may be looking at um, your first workload or first use case on Citrix on Azure. It's a, a theme of experimentation, and your management's really focusing on delivery. You know, let's start with this initial use case. We're going to be successful, and then from there, you know, as we start to experiment, learn lessons learned, get this adapted to our overall operations within our enterprise, that's when you start shifting into a cloud consumer. You've had success with that initial use case. And it shifts from a team of experimentation to a theme of leverage. Um, how can we now, you know, what we've learned from this initial process, let's add another use case. We're going to start, you know, scaling this out within our business, and we're going to start operationalizing this process. And from there, as you start to operationalize and consume more cloud resources, you know, you shift into what's known as a cloud broker, where now it's more so, you know, we have success with Azure East. Now let's start looking at, you know, deploying workloads in Azure West. Azure in Europe and start really scaling out and brokering a cloth across clouds within different geographies. And it really turns into a theme of optimization where the focus shifts into governance. Now, how are we operating? Let's make sure that we're growing and scaling this, uh, these resources within Microsoft Azure in a way that makes the most sense for our business. So going from and thinking about that cloud journey, your organization may be in you know, one of those three phases. Um, and, and really one of the, the platforms from a Citrix perspective that we really want to focus on is Citrix Cloud, um, really a way where it's a Citrix technology delivered through a management plane where you can extend your existing deployments and embrace that hybrid cloud across all of your resource locations. Um, Microsoft Azure data centers as you're transitioning into the cloud uh, where the management is operated by Citrix and your workloads are wherever you'd like them to be. So you can manage that data, that IP that can exist within your control. Now thinking of Citrix Cloud and leveraging Citrix Cloud within Azure, how does it, how does it differentiate? What is the, the primary difference here with um, that standard FMA architecture you may see in, uh, in 7.x? Uh, On-premise, uh, you have all those components, those control components, your delivery controllers, your storefront servers, your workloads, or uh, virtual delivery agents, BDAs, all existing within your data center under your control. And um, you know, you're faced with the maintenance, the update cycles, the, the management that's associated with those tools, um, the database maintenance, you know, upgrading from you know, 7.6 long-term service release to 7.15, or even facing potentially a 6.5 migration. Um, the, the difference with Citrix Cloud is we've taken uh, some of those control components and we've shifted them from a Zen Apps and Desktop service perspective into our control and our management. 
So when we say Citrix Cloud, we're not saying, you know, hey, this is a, co a competing service with Azure. No, that's, that's not the case at all. We are actually giving you a management plane where you can actually take that control aspect of that FlexCast, that FMA architecture, your delivery controllers, your uh, license servers, storefront, SQL, et cetera, and we, you shift that into our management. So now you can consume our latest features, you can consume our technologies without the overhead that's associated with the maintenance of those materials. And then from your Azure subscription, you can actually deploy and deliver and, and manage those and utilize our control plane to manage those workloads. So you have that full control of you know, maintaining your data within your, within your subscription or within your data center. And one of the great things about shifting, and especially when you're in that building phase where you're looking at you know, cloud and you're looking towards uh, Microsoft Azure, is you know, connecting into an Azure subscription or connecting into your existing data center as you're transitioning into the cloud, that's really done through uh, cloud connectors where you're shifting and you're utilizing that technology to allow you that management plane, Citrix Cloud, to control those resources within Azure. And uh, Citrix Cloud, is, you know, from a Citrix architectural standpoint, um, is what will be the primary focus as we kind of go through and highlight some of the key architecture principles. And from that, uh, from that regard, I'd like to pass it off to uh, my colleague Jeff as we kind of really talk about how do we make this a reality. How do we make this reality of Citrix on Azure come to fruition? And whenever we're looking at um, Azure from a standpoint of moving a workload, we like to think in uh, these five uh, fundamental tenets of Azure, right? Um, and so the idea is that any solution you're deploying is going to touch one of these tenets, but what are the ones uh, inside of these tenets, what are the really specific uh, details that you need to know, you need to be thoughtful about when considering your, uh, your deployment of Citrix on Azure, right? Um, so, you know, operations and identity control, many of the, the people, um, process and tooling, um, governance as well. Uh, security breaks into monitoring and management and, and, and auditing, and then connectivity is about making sure that we have that um, all important uh, connection into from either data center or just from over the cloud uh, into Azure, and making sure that all of these uh, different tenets are from the point of view of uh, Citrix, your Citrix workload on Azure, right? Um, so Let's kind of look uh, at each one of these and break it down in detail uh, further with looking at Citrix. So operations, what we're talking about here is, um, you know, our, our operations of, of uh, deployment, uh, the different deployment models that we have in Azure. PowerShell is more of an um, iterative approach uh, to deploying your resources on Azure, where Azure CLI is more of a declarative approach where you can uh, don't have to know necessarily the order of operations that resources need to be configured in Azure. Um, and, then, and then we have uh, ARM templates, uh, which are uh, another function of operating in Azure that allows you to take all of your resources and define them as a, as a, a single template. Um, and then our, our Azure API as well. So uh, on the Citrix side of this, we've, you know, we've got image management, service monitoring support, um, but with the Azure side of it, we've We've got um, the, the operations of deploying the infrastructure, the install, manage, config layer. So when we look at business continuity, we're thinking about disaster recovery as a service and those kind of options. So um, let's dig into looking at, at, at operations, right, and our, our best practices with Citrix. So one of those pieces, too, and, and um, what Jeff mentioned is business continuity and, and setting up availability. So as you're planning and thinking about those operations and defining what that SLA is going to be for your Citrix workloads on cloud, uh, one of the key pieces of you know, driving uh, greater levels of availability within Azure is the concept of an availability set. Um, so as you're looking towards deploying um, Citrix within you know, that initial target region in Azure, or you know, say for instance, you already have workloads in Azure and you're, you're, you're targeting a new region for your Citrix environment, uh, you want to take those best practices of uh, using availability sets to group like VMs and spread them across different failure and update domains within that data center to really drive that initial uh, availability within that region. Now, from an SLA perspective, if you need to provide greater levels of availability, this might also factor into you know, doing multiple regions, for instance, as part of that initial phase as you roll it into production. So that would come from you know, starting where you have you know, multiple cloud connectors, for instance, within that single uh, you know, Azure East, and you're going to set them up an availability set. And then you're looking towards, for instance, an Azure West because you want to provide you know, regional availability between, for, for the specific workload. You would take the same concept where you would then take two cloud connectors, so you have component availability, set them up in an availability set within Azure West, so you then have that data center availability 
uh, within that Azure data center. And then you also then have that extra region where you have Azure East and Azure West. So that's something as you really approach this project, uh, you know, or approach Citrix on Azure from an operational standpoint, thinking about the level of availability you need for where you are in the project is definitely a critical first step. Uh, the next piece is really also like the instance sizing. Uh, what type of instances should you use uh, from a uh, Citrix on Azure perspective when you're deploying out the IaaS workloads needed to uh, run your overall deployment? Um, from a workload standpoint, especially, you know, comparison to on-prem, we'll have a lot, we have a lot of customers that tend to, you know, pay. Uh, you have a little more linear scalability in 2012 R2 and 2016. I'm just going to grow these servers and scale out, scale up in a way that makes sense for my hardware. Uh, with cloud, it, uh, you, you want to approach it differently, especially when it comes to uh, some of the compute and where we're driving, for instance, um, you know, some of the initial costs you'd have when you consume these workloads. Um, if you have instances that are running and they're on, um, regardless if there's users being uh, accessing them, they're, you know, that's something that is going to be charged towards your Azure subscription. So from a scale up or scale out perspective, we've actually seen uh, customers use, you know, smaller instances, for instance, like, you know, the D2 V2 series or, you know, D4 V2 where it's, you know, two, two CPU, seven gigs of RAM or for vCPU, 14 gigs of RAM respectively, they're using smaller instances, but they're having more of them and then managing with our machine creation services for single image management. This gives uh, customers much more efficient power operations uh, where they can, for instance, you know, we have, uh, you know, smaller numbers of users per machine. We hit down periods. We're going to use uh, Citrix technologies like SmartScale to control the power operations of these machines. So that way, you know, when we have periods of downtime, you know, we're driving more cost efficiency within our operations by having greater flexibility to control these workloads. Since we don't have, you know, 50 users on a server, we have, you know, two or three users on it, you know, we can't kick them off. And so, because, so, but we're, so you're paying a hard, higher per user per cost, you know, for that overall instance. So kind of just with some of that initial background, just some of the conversations that we typically have with customers regarding operations, you know, what are some of the lessons learned? Uh, like I mentioned before, you know, at the start of your project, really plan for those different levels of availability. A component being, you know, having multiple, you know, deli uh, cloud connectors or, you know, uh, multiple NetScaler VPXs. And you see those core infrastructure components always plan for an N plus one uh, delivery of that type of component. Uh, next is also the data center availability, like we mentioned, by configuring those Azure availability sets. And then lastly, it's that regional availability where you look into potentially having multiple regions. Uh, to, to, ma to maintain, you know, uptime and in advance of maintenance or, you know, provide greater levels of avail availability uh, within your deployment. And then also MCS is a must. Um, right now, provisioning services, a lot of customers on-premise uh, utilize PVS for their image management um, of their Citrix environment. So transitioning to the cloud, um, especially just because of some of the back-end network of, of any cloud provider, PVS isn't an option. MCS is the uh, primary method, method for image management, uh, but we're, the MCS service on Azure is really derived out of the Azure API. We're using uh, Azure technologies to really drive that scale and single image management similar to what you're used to on-premise. Uh, so it's something where as you're transitioning to the cloud, uh, you know, the management of PVS for M first MCS is, is different. So definitely take the time in, in the lab to start leveraging MCS and getting used to that deployment method, but it does provide that abil ability to really have that single image management golden image that you're used to on-premise. But as you think about your operations, one thing that's also definitely worth investigating is app layering. Uh, app layering is something that where you can take the platform of your on-premise hypervisor and also have a platform layer for Azure where you're managing one single OS across multiple, you know, pretty much multiple hypervisors, public cloud of Azure versus your on-premise hypervisor. It's something where we also had another webinar on app layering. And it's something definitely recommend, uh, like Sarah mentioned at the beginning, going into the archive and taking a look at that for a deep dive, because that's something where as you're transitioning to the cloud or even operating in a hybrid cloud where you're going from that cloud broker to cloud consumer, it's something that can really help you centralize your management across, you know, your, your public cloud that you're leveraging with Azure, as well as your on-premise data center as you're hybridized. Um, so it's some, definitely, you know, as a follow-up for this webinar, if you have the time, take a look at that. Um, a listen to that tips webinar on app layering because it's something that will really help you uh, drive and consolidate your image management across on-premise and cloud. And then shifting from there, uh, Jeff, would you like to walk us through identity? Yeah, so with your identity on Azure, 
um, you really want to look at uh, making sure that you have a model for which to build on your uh, your application support and your infrastructure support and your auditing, right? So um, Azure Active, Active Directory is, is the management layer of all those items. So uh, if we look to further extend our Azure Active Directory into our Citrix environment, uh, we want to be able to have single sign-on for our cloud applications and integration into the Azure AD app marketplace. Um, as, as well as provide this identity model that will be used for our role-based access control. When we talk about governance, it will also be used for um, uh, our Citrix environments, right, for our, for our end users um, and our control for our administrators to which uh, they will have different management uh, roles. Uh, so executing uh, the provisioning of uh, extra infrastructure, core infrastructure resources, uh, servers that might be needed for a solution, um, and separating the administrative control between an administrator who's going to uh, run those virtual machines and configure them versus an administrator who's going to be operating inside of them. So our identity model here uh, and using Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, allows us to span into uh, each component that we build underlying uh, the Azure control layer into the Citrix uh, environment that we're building out. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. And when thinking of um, Azure Active Directory, especially with the Citrix environment, uh, one piece to really think about as well is, you know, AD domain service will still be uh, a requirement of, of the Citrix environment we're putting on Azure, as well as, you know, probably a lot of the applications and other technologies that you might have within the overall app and desktop deployment that you're targeting uh, for Azure Public Cloud adoption. So as you start looking towards, uh, you know, building that initial cloud or, you know, starting to consume those services, you know, setting up and, you know, creating a domain presence within Azure is something that you might have already walked through that process, especially if you're doing like an Office 365 or is something you need to plan for. Um, Citrix as a whole still needs that Active Directory domain services within that overall architecture to function as expected. Uh, and with that in mind, especially with um, workloads and, and uh, app and desktop workloads utilizing, you know, uh, roaming profiles, for instance, uh, Azure Storage Spaces Direct is a new, uh, new storage uh, mechanism that you can leverage for high avail highly available storage uh, within your Azure deployment. And something definitely worth uh, looking into um, as you start approaching, you know, how do we set up a profile storage for our, you know, Zen app profiles that we're going to have within the overall environment. We have a handful of customers that have looked towards Azure and they're leveraging this technology to provide a highly available and a um, high availability for their profiles within that Azure resource location. Uh, the next piece as well, and especially with Azure Active Directory, uh, there's a lot of great advantages with Azure AD, for instance, you know, separating that identity from, you know, that on-premise AD domain services for, like, say, a contractor, for instance. We don't want them to understand or know what their actual on-premise credentials are because we want to segment that. They're a contractor. They're temporary. We're going to utilize Azure Active Directory, provide them that single sign-on through our Office 365 Azure App Marketplace. But, you know, we need them to access, you know, standard Windows workloads. Um, you know, maybe you're deploying an app with 2012 R2 or you're still leveraging, you know, a variety of desktops. That's where, you know, federated authentication services comes into play, where you can actually utilize and have that full single sign-on where I'm logging in, I'm hitting my Azure AD, I'm using Azure MFA, and I want to then launch a desktop, um, you know, that's based on, you know, 2012 R2, some of my legacy applications, and I want that single sign-on. Uh, that's where Federate Authentication Services comes into play and something that should be a consideration for your overall Citrix architecture as you look into uh, leveraging Azure Active Directory for some of your workloads uh, within Citrix. So really summarize a a AD, uh, domain services and standard on-prem is something that's still a requirement. It needs to be part of your planning process, uh, but we do have the technologies that within Federated Authentication Services to allow over time to transition to that cloud-based identity with Azure Active, Dir uh, Active Directory. So now with our uh, having our identity model in place and our operations and model in place, we can take a look at governance. Building out policies around our subscriptions, around our uh, resource groups that hold our resources, and then around our resources themselves inside of Azure for um, you know, special configurations such as uh, all, di uh, all operating system disks need to be um, encrypted or uh, subscription configurations for user roles and administrat administrative controls. 
Um, using Azure Active Directory, you know, we can implement this level of control and governance, um, as well as uh, in, in conjunction with the role-based access control that's in Azure, um, we can uh, put this governance foot map and for our operations in place um, that we can, we can meet our compliance uh, there, as well as control our each individual resources in Azure uh, on a uh, granular level. A lot of that granularity is derived through the concept of a resource group in Azure. Um, a resource group, think of it as a logical organization or a container of, you know, your, your, virtual, your virtual machines, NICs, you know, uh, virtual networks, any, anything that's really an Azure component um, is stored within a resource group. So these containers are really what's used, one, for, you know, billing and tagging purposes, but also from a permission standpoint, where you can leverage Azure Active Directory to apply Azure role-based access control to these resources. Uh, so from a Citrix standpoint, as you're going through that governance discussion and you're planning out, you know, how are we going to organize these Citrix resources within Azure, um, having um, a granularity uh, to those resource groups is something that can really help you, you know, as you start to expand or, you know, as you start to grow and consume more cloud, it gives you the ability to have proper delegation between your teams uh, when you start deploying resources within your Citrix environment. So a great example I like to always have, uh, deliver is, for instance, you know, I have a Citrix environment, I'm leveraging uh, Netscaler, and I have a networking team who's going to manage those virtual appliances that exist within my Azure resource location. Now my Citrix team, for instance, you know, we shouldn't have the permissions, you know, if uh, thinking of a least privileged model, you know, if I'm not gonna touch those Netscalers in my day to day, I really don't need any permissions to manage those Azure resources associated with them. So a lot of times customers will say, for instance, have you know, a resource group with just the Citrix infrastructure, so like cloud connectors, you know, anything associated with uh, managing and operating that Citrix environment, and then a separate resource group for the Netscalers. And then, uh, for instance, I, within my Azure environment, I'm going to have core services I might need to consume, uh, like we mentioned before, in the identity, like my Azure, um, having an AD do uh, domain controller uh, within my Azure subscription, you know, that's something that's a core service that should be separated from a delegation standpoint entirely from that Citrix team, as well as like any core network services like the virtual networks or user-defined routes. Uh, that's something that, you know, uh, typically a customer will, you know, bundle that into a resource group, uh, give uh, Citrix administrators like a read-only so they can understand what's there, but then that's completely managed by the networking team. So as you approach, you know, the creation of those resource groups and really, you know, setting up some of the governance uh, within your Azure resources, really approach it in a way where you can uh, control it granularly. Uh, so you, as you grow and as you gain new team members, you're taking a least privileged model and assigning those roles, our back permissions in a way that, you know, fits the compliance requirements you have within your organization. So to really highlight again and just, you know, be mindful of, of that granularity with resource groups, uh, this is all stored within an Azure subscription. Uh, so Azure subscriptions are really the mechanism for, you know, really starting to govern and delegate out uh, resources within Azure, just like Jeff mentioned. Uh, these subscriptions tend to have, uh, they have limits. Uh, the limits are there from a scalability standpoint, performance standpoint, as well as, you know, as you start to grow, you know, to make sure that you're not suddenly, you know, hey, we want to touch Azure. We can't, we don't want to provision a thousand VMs and then get charged for a thousand VMs. Um, so always be mindful of what those limits are as you continue to grow. And definitely something as you, you know, finish up this webinar, take the time to, you know, uh, go through and actually go into some of the Azure product documentation and review that information. Common limits you typically hit for Citrix environments tend to be the cores per region, uh, number of VMs, uh, number of VMs as well, or number of uh, disks per region if you're using uh, managed disks uh, within your uh, Azure subscription. And, and those subscriptions, thinking of them as that bundle of, you know, this is my logical, you know, billing mechanism, this is my logical structure of how I'm going to consume these Azure resources. Uh, you can have multiple subscriptions for a specific organization. A lot of times, enterprises will typically have a subscription per department uh, to facilitate, you know, one, so you don't have departments competing against one another uh, for those resources, as well as, you know, make billing a little more simpler since billing is done at a subscription level. Uh, so typically, we recommend customers, especially if you have, if you're in like that enterprise commercial space where you see yourself, you know, maybe servicing, you know, hundreds of thousands of users, uh, to consider a dedicated Citrix subscription where you have, you know, that Azure subscription, it's dedicated for Citrix specific resources. Uh, so that way you don't get to get to a scenario where you're potentially, you know, competing uh, for, you know, those, those, you know, cores per region or you, you butt heads with other, other departments or have billing confusion because you're going to have, you know, multiple resources across multiple teams all stored within one subscription. 
So something to think of and plan for and, and discuss within your organization as you're really structuring out the governance model uh, for your cloud, uh, for your overall Azure cloud deployment. It's something that, you know, this is a conversation that, you know, as you start to scale, as you shift from that consumer into broker, if you don't have the proper governance models in place, it's something where, and I've, I've seen from experience, where, you know, we want to have this work use case in, you know, we're going to deploy in a separate region. But wait a second, you know, we've never thought of the, the process of, you know, how we're going to manage that second region, or we have multiple departments that are, wait, we need to provision resources here, but we're going to consume and hit the subscription limits that impact another department. So this is something that it's, you know, that governance is a conversation you always want to have with, you know, any sort of cloud project um, as you really start to approach, you know, Citrix on Azure and uh, in your, in that overall deployment model. So we've got our governance, our identity in place, our operations. Now we look at security and we start to think of how can we manage um, our security footprint, our, our enterprise security architecture inside of Azure. Uh, integrations with uh, encryption from our, from our policies, um, typical threat detection and endpoint protection, um, you know, uh, they come along as a configuration. We have Azure Security Center um, that allows you to centralize the management of your continuous security assessments, right, of your hybrid cloud workloads uh, and other workloads. Uh, but also, uh, you know, we need to watch out what goes happens on the network. So when we look at Citrix on Azure, we think like here are the three things. We, need, we want to look at firewall configurations, making sure our least privilege is assigned, uh, data loss prevention and compliance detection. So we'll, we'll use uh, Security Center in conjunction with Log Analytics, um, Azure Logs, uh, Audit Logs, um, to build our views and alerts for those um, configuration items. Uh, network security groups are put in place for um, basically applying ACLs, uh, access control lists to different subnets and, and even uh, like uh, Kevin had talked about our uh, user-defined routes, right, for when we're working with our, our net scalers and controlling the networking inside of a single subnet. Um, so let's look like into more detail, uh, Kevin, from what you've got here on, on our networks. So in this example, uh, you can see from this example our subnets are broken out. We've got network security groups on each one of those uh, networks that are listed there. Exactly. And um, so with the network security groups, thinking of, you know, as you're planning uh, that Citrix virtual network and thinking through, you know, this is, this is another very core foundational item uh, to your overall uh, Citrix on Azure architecture. You know, thinking of that subscription, I have, you know, that, that initial foundation where I'm going to work, you know, my, still fall into the governance model that I have for my, organi my organization. This virtual network is something where, you know, this is where all of your VMs are going to exist. So taking that initial virtual network and planning out the subnet structure, especially when it comes to security and the application of those, uh, those access control lists, you know, network security groups is definitely a critical factor. And now network security groups and those user-defined routes, you know, directing the traffic in a way that makes the most sense, you know, maybe routing it through a firewall appliance or controlling how it's going to flow within your, within your overall cloud. This is something that's applied at the subnet level. So typically, you know, again, thinking of that granularity and be, really being able to, you know, manage and, you know, one, adapt a chain. So, for instance, like a new a use case comes into play or, you know, adapt to, you know, infrastructure requirements um, if, those, if those were to change. Having a granular set of subnets within your virtual network that you're deploying through your Citrix environment is critical. Um, so, for example, what's seen on the screen here is typically we'll see customers, you know, create separate subnets within their virtual network for the net scalers, for instance, uh, or the Citrix infrastructure so they can control, you know, the security groups, uh, the network security groups that they can apply to those machines. I've actually even seen customers where they've actually had a different subnet for each piece of Citrix infrastructure because they wanted to have security groups where they block pretty much every other port except for the critical ports uh, for that piece of infrastructure. Uh, based on their security requirements. And another common piece as well is also having separate subnets for uh, the use cases. So for instance, if I'm going to have a set of VDI workloads or a set of um, RDS workloads, um, I'm going to have, you know, two separate subnets and then maybe additional subnets based on uh, the use cases that I'm going to grow into. Uh, definitely be mindful um, as you plan out uh, that virtual network of the uh, limits associated with that, um, each virtual network within Azure as of today. And this is something Microsoft is continuing to uh, grow and, and increase those limits. Uh, you have around 8,192 IPs per virtual network. Um, so if you start to scale or say, for instance, have a very large uh, Citrix deployment, you can always have multiple networks and then peer them together so they can communicate. Uh, so thinking of, of security and especially, um, you know, starting with some of that network uh, conversation we just highlighted, 
Um, again, create those separate subnets for your infrastructure workloads and you know, use cases so you can apply those network security groups granularly. And from there, you know, a lot of the on-premise Citrix recommendations we have from a security standpoint still apply within Azure. Um, encrypting the traffic between your infrastructure components with SSL, uh, using a you know, contextual access-based methodology where you can apply Citrix policies based on you know, internal and external users utilizing things like Netscaler and, and smart access. Uh, taking a you know, least privileged model when it comes to you know, redirections of drives or clipboard mapping. So say for instance, you know, having as part of your baseline, disabling all the redirections and then enabling those redirections uh, you know, based on the use case rather than having it be default within the overall uh, Citrix deployment. Those recommendations still apply when you approach uh, Citrix on Azure and that's something where you know, say you're going from on-prem and you have some of those controls still in place through Citrix policy, you can still apply those within your Azure resource location. And the last piece to our, our fundamentals here are gonna, is going to be on connectivity. Right? There's two options to connect to an Azure data center. Uh, you can use our site-to-site -site VPNs, uh, or you can use ExpressRoute in the context of, of Citrix. Um, and we want to plan these types of, of connections according to what your bandwidth and latency issues are, as well as the types of protocols you'll be using in your deployment, right? So our standard SKUs um, in uh, the realm of our VPNs, our standard SKUs, if you're looking for uh, BGP, transitive BGP, you're not going to get that there. Um, so there's, uh, you know, when you look at your connectivity with the VPNs versus Express Route, we're looking at the use cases, and we're going to provide you with some some ideas for these use cases on either either type of connection, um, and then you know when you are looking at uh, the types of connections you will have to Azure, whether it be VPN or Express Route, what are the types of services you're going to send um, over those routes, um, and what are the uh, what are the traffic patterns for that type of data, right? So if we're talking about um, domain replication traffic or if we're talking about database replication traffic, um, you know, we, many times when we treat, uh, try to achieve high availability inside of Azure, we'll use some of the built-in features that we have in SQL uh, to, to um, create a um, high availability uh, set of the, the, that database uh, residing on premises as well as in Azure. Um, so if we look at that uh, and, and kind of look at, okay, well, in, in our world with Citrix, how does that relate to a Netscaler, right? How does that contain, how does that deal, uh, you know, how does that relate to uh, uh, SD-WAN, for example? So, and so thinking of Netscaler too, and especially with the connectivity and how you approach uh, that conversation uh, within within Azure, it, it, one, you know, both the SD-WAN as well as the Netscaler VPX um, for like an access delivery controller or Netscaler gateway are all deployed from the Azure marketplace. And from a, a Netscaler perspective, especially um, when looking towards, you know, we want to provide uh, like a great example of this is I see customers say, we're going to have users authenticate, you know, on-premise, and then we're going to use things like optimal gateway routing, for instance, and I want to hit a Netscaler and have my users connect to a Netscaler directly within my Azure uh, and things along those lines. Or, you know, I have a use case where we're going to have, you know, custom users in EMEA, and I want to have those users authenticate and hit a Netscaler in EMEA. You have that flexibility and the ability to deploy that Netscaler from Azure directly into your Azure subscription through the marketplace. But there are, you know, different considerations, especially if you're moving from like a hardware based Netscaler to this virtual based appliance. And that really impacts, you know, how do you approach active, active, or active, passive, high availability? Uh, so for instance, something like a, Net, a Netscaler clustering is not available uh, within, Azure, uh, within Azure. So typically approaching that active, active, or active, passive conversation, you know, starts with utilizing, you know, uh, platform based services like the Azure Load Balancer, where you can actually then direct, you know, that traffic between your, your multiple Netscaler appliances, and then scale out utilizing multiple Netscaler nodes within your subscription and then leveraging, you know, Citrix technologies such as Citrix Netscaler Management and Analytics to, you know, manage that scale out as you're starting to, you know, add more Netscalers to your environment as you grow into, you know, expanding use cases, et cetera. And uh, functions such as, you know, if you want, especially when we think of that, you know, regional availability conversation, uh, functions such as global server load balancing or Azure, that's something where you can leverage those Netscalers within your subscription to uh, redirect using DNS level load balancing across multiple data centers. So for instance, you know, starting with a single region, you know, we're focusing on this use case as a, you know, cloud builder, we're starting to consume the services, let's add, you know, another one or two Netscaler nodes to scale out 
that within the region to a company are growing demand as we shift to a consumer. We're starting to become a broker. We want to add another Azure region and uh, provision across multiple geographies at uh, you know, one, maybe closer proximity to some end users or you know, greater availability uh, for, for overall workloads. You can leverage NetScale or GSLB for global server load balancing to facilitate uh, those, co those communications or failover across those data centers. Uh, when you approach the sizing of uh, you know, the NetScale or VPXs or SD-WAN appliances, um, taking a look and understanding the type of VPX license that you're applying to that instance. Um, for instance, you know, you know, that's going to control the number of cores you can use or packet engines you can use within that appliance. Um, and it also, the instance size also controls the number of NICs that you can associate with that instance, as well as the max amount of throughput that that instance can have. So as you start to, you know, plan and evaluate leveraging our networking technologies within Azure, uh, be mindful of the capabilities of the instance that you're going to use for the NetScaler. And uh, similar to uh, what we mentioned before, back when discussing the instance sizing and how you should approach that operationally, a very common instance size for um, infrastructure as a starting point uh, is the D series, the D2, B2 series is fairly common starting point for a lot of customers. And you know the great thing about Azure is like okay we need to scale up. That's really just it's a reboot, and you'll be able to uh, upsize uh, your VMs as you grow. And that's something that you know similar process you can take with the infrastructure as you plan out uh, your cloud deployment. So as Jeff mentioned, especially um, that connect to connecting into Azure with the VPN or Express Route, you know multiple you know communication streams or, or different types of data could typically flows through that connection. Uh, within a Citrix environment. So you're typically sharing that. So especially if you have, say, for instance, users within your data center, within your office, connecting to re workloads in Azure, their ICA traffic may go across that connection, that express route or that VPN. Now, if you're, say, for instance, you know, replicating your, your domain information into Azure, or you have, you know, an application where your backend might still exist on-prem and some of that communication is going through that VPN or express route, if that starts to get clogged, similar to which, you know, any network uh, that your ICA is traveling to on-prem, uh, it's going to impact the user experience. Uh, so, typically, so definitely consider that, that VPN or that express route is a critical piece from an infrastructure perspective of your Citrix environment, and you want to monitor its utilization accordingly, especially if it's being shared across a lot of services. Now, that's the example I mentioned before, often with gateway routing, uh, that's a great way to redirect, for instance, you know, your Citrix ICA session out of that express route. Uh, so for instance, instead of you know, I go in, I authenticate, I go to connect, I set up in, you know, using a traditional storefront, I want to set it up where, you know, after I've connected, I'm going to hit my NetScaler and, you know, my Azure DMZ that I've set up within my virtual network, and then connect through my internet service provider instead of going through, you know, that express route of connecting directly into Azure. So you then kind of hit that ITA through your, through your internet into the, the Azure securely and then have a, a better user experience and also save uh, express route utilization. Uh, so that's something that where some customers, you know, maybe they want to, you know, grow out their express route over time. And instead of having, you know, that competing, you know, traffic, they, they are using that as an alternate method to connect into Azure. Uh, and as well as, you know, the VPXs, I know we really spend time kind of going into, you know, some of the intricacies. Definitely take the time to, you know, go through and review in Citrix product documentation some of the differences. Uh, from a innovation standpoint, investment, we work with Microsoft. You know, you have the abilities like uh, GSLB and the ability to really use, you know, things like uh, smart access or that contextual access like we mentioned before. Just the approach of the deployment is a little bit different. And uh, we have guides within our product documentation that can walk you through those differences. So this brings us to the, the next step. You've, you've really started and you looked at your operations, you know, what do we need to change from a cloud perspective and how we manage and, you know, transition from, you know, our on-premise data center into leveraging the capabilities and scale of Azure. You know, how do we change these operations and factor in, you know, be existing in hybrid, shifting from, you know, PBS to MCS and leveraging maybe something like Citrix app layering to manage those in images. You know, from an identity standpoint, how can we leverage the capabilities of Azure Active Directory uh, to, you know, provide single sign-on to greater numbers of applications in a growing app marketplace uh, within Microsoft Azure. Thinking of the governance, you know, how are we going to organize our subscriptions and how are you going to approach, you know, application of your uh, Azure role-based access controls to your environment? And then how do we secure this? What's the way that we, the best ways that we can set up our virtual network to make sure that our networks are secured and leverage Azure Security Center to, you know, add additional monitoring capabilities into our global deployment? And then connectivity, what type of connection do we need you know, to really bridge our data center with Microsoft Azure. 
you know, going through this process and going through and understanding these architecture principles is really one of the first keys to success. And there are a lot of ways that Citrix can walk you through and work, you, uh, work with you to go through this process so you don't have to go at it alone. Um, from a, a consulting standpoint, we have our assessment and really sitting down and, and going through and understanding your cloud strategy so we can build a design. Uh, from an educational standpoint, we've collaborated with Microsoft on really, you know, we want to deploy Citrix Cloud on Azure. Uh, we have courses that uh, really identify the basics that you need to know. And it's a lot of the concepts that we've covered within this uh, webinar in greater detail, as well as implementation. Um, I, you know, I have a big deadline. You know, it's, we're, we have to maintain today. We, we, it's hard, you know, managing. We need to go out and implement this and set this up. Or we want to shift into automation. We want to leverage you know, the Azure API, Azure ARM templates, and we want to automate and you know, add more automation and really consume with more of a cloud consumer mentality and leveraging those capabilities within Azure to you know, optimize our business, as well as you know, thinking past that, you know, how do we manage and control this uh, through Citrix managed workloads? So we're here to help. Um, this isn't something that you have to go out alone. And this is also, you know, approaching cloud is not something that, like I mentioned before, you have to really dive in and just do everything all at once. You can really go in phases, and the Citrix technologies are designed to let you do that, especially with Citrix Cloud and the ability to use our management plane to control resources across, you know, your existing data centers, as well as, you know, future workloads in Microsoft Azure. So kind of really just a couple of key takeaways. You know, Citrix Cloud is a management plane that enhances your ability to deploy workspaces from Azure. Uh, we are... It's a, a technology that you can use to, you know, really consume and leverage Azure workloads that are maintained with your, in your control. So your IP, your data exists within the control of your data, data center, but you're offloading some of the, you know, system management processes associated with upgrades and maintaining a Citrix infrastructure. And as you phase and go through that approach of really understanding and leveraging these five key architecture principles, you can build that Azure footprint over time and really start, you know, starting that builder mentality of experimentation. Let's target you know, a use case that's going to really drive a lot of value in our business, build confidence, establish those governance policies, establish that, those operations, and then grow that footprint over time, approach, you know, multiple data centers, approach, you know, scaling up, you know, even potentially sometimes across multiple subscriptions, uh, depending on the size of your workloads. Let's grow this over time, leverage the consumption base, you know, scale up, scale down, at the agile nature of Azure to grow that. And then, you know, Citrix and Microsoft, we're here to help uh, people like Jeff and myself, you know, we've gone through this process and Citrix and Microsoft have worked with other customers such as yourselves to really grow and really start uh, establishing Azure as a resource location for their Citrix environment. So thank you very much and uh, for everyone to tune in and then we'll probably take off with some questions. But Sarah, do you have any uh, additional words? Sure. Thank you both Kevin and Jeff. That was an incredible uh, session today. Before we move into the Q&A, I'd like to remind our audience that if you have any questions for these guys, you can submit it in the Ask a Question area on your screen. Simply type your question into the text box and then hit Submit. I know we're getting close to the hour, so we likely won't have time to answer all of your questions here today live, but certainly keep an eye on the Citrix blog and we'll um, post shortly some of the FAQs that we don't get to. Okay, it looks like we've got quite a bit of really fantastic questions coming through to the queue. Uh, before I hand it back over to Kevin, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording today's session, and both the recording and the slide deck will be available um, through the link that you use to access the event um, today. So make sure to check that out after the fact if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, Kevin, uh, without further ado, let me hand it over to you. It looks like we've got quite a bit to cover in the next 20 minutes. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so first question uh, comes from Eric. Citrix Cloud wouldn't host non-VDA application and database servers, correct? So if you have a homegrown application that makes frequent database calls from the Citrix desktops, this wouldn't be a good question. Uh, this wouldn't be a good application unless they're installed locally in Citrix Cloud. Uh, Eric, great question. And uh, just to clarify what exactly Citrix Cloud is. So Citrix Cloud is, is a management plane. We're actually not hosting any of the VDAs within Citrix Cloud itself, we're giving you a mechanism to control those apps and desktops. So, and that's where Azure comes into play. So talking about that homegrown application, you're making frequent database calls, you know, you would set up a resource location where that application exists um, with Citrix Cloud. So for instance, you would install the VDAs within your data center or within your Azure subscription, and then Citrix Cloud will allow you to manage those workloads as they sit close to 
that homegrown application. So your homegrown app would, wouldn't be going into our systems. It's you know, your data stays on premise securely, and you also get the user experience of having a VDA or you know that workload in close proximity to your your database. So Citrix Cloud again is, is a management plane. It allows you to really control uh, those uh, Zen app and Zen desktop resources in a location that makes the most sense for your end users, whether it be your data center or whether it be a public cloud such as Azure. Moving to the next question, how about a global presence at EMEA, Americas, and APAC? Um, Jeff, would you want to maybe talk a little bit about uh, Microsoft's global presence through, uh, through Azure? Sure. We've got 38 regions around the world, um, and we pair each one of our data centers uh, or regions is what they called um, with another region, right, for the sake of resiliency and redundancy. So we've got a good footprint uh, of, of active uh, regions as well as um, we're thinking about things like uh, your your uh, disaster recovery scenarios there, and and we want to have locations to get those homegrown apps right close to where our user base is, so we can um, have the best performance possible. So, um, you know, uh, in the United States, I think of uh, U.S. East, we've got. Um, uh, extensibility there uh, built out into you know the West Coast Central and up into Canada as well as um, down um, into Central America so you know we've got a lot of presence in this area we've got a lot of presence around the world 38 regions um, and we're right now we have planned 42 so that's growing um, as we go and from a Citrix Cloud perspective as well, like thinking about multi-region and establishing a global presence, um, that's where the resource locations come in. Um, so for instance, you know, if you were starting, say, with a resource location at MIA and you were building out those cloud connectors to integrate with those applications within that geography, and you needed to establish a, another region in a, in a, a different geography, in a different, you know, say the Americas, for instance, uh, that starts with, you know, setting up your, you know, as Azure virtual network in that region, and then adding cloud connectors and deploying the BDAs within that region. Uh, that's kind of where that, where that resource location concept comes to play. And establishing resource locations in multiple geographies can drive that global presence uh, for your organization, especially with the wide footprint of Azure. Uh, moving on to the next question from Chris, are availability sets only required for ZenApp and Zen Desktop Platinum licensing deployments on Azure? Or do availability sets also need to be considered for Citrix Cloud? So availability sets overall from a Citrix perspective is definitely a best practice, whether it be for a Citrix Cloud deployment, which is what we highlighted um, in this webinar, or traditional Zen apps and desktop. If you were to say deploy a 7.x architecture that your company would manage themselves uh, within an Azure data center. Um, it's, it's an overall just, you know, Microsoft recommended practice with regards to um, IaaS in Azure. And, and Jeff, would you want to maybe provide a little bit of clarity and, and a deeper dive into availability sets? Yeah, so I think a good way to think of availability set is um, providing the application with the HA that it desires, right? Um, and this is in the context of managed infrastructure on a public cloud. So when um, the internal Azure system sees an availability set, what we see inside of that availability set is a fault domain and an update domain. And the fault domain really just uh, means two separate racks, right, in the, inside of the data center. So um, in, the, in, in the situation that uh, there was a hardware failure, you'd be protected from the hardware, hardware failure inside of that rack. The update domain is, you know, uh, we go through on in the data center um, and we are applying updates to the underlying host and to the infrastructure and services. So the update domain allows us to see that uh, and within your set, your availability set, you have two services that um, we do not want to update uh, the underlying host on at the same time. Um, so this allows us to go through and update the data center at the same time, protects your service availability um, for uh, you know, what's being hosted in that availability set. So Netscalers, I think, are, are a good example, right? Netscalers, um, we have them running an availability set. So as we go through and we do updates on the underlying host for those Netscalers, we have uh, no downtime, right? Um, um, on our virtual machines, we've gotten that down. Uh, to a near zero time uh, there of, of, of any kind of downtime with the, the technology we're using underlying inside of Azure um, for the update side. But in the event that there was a fault domain, you'd still have that other net scale that would be available. Same thing with your controllers and so on and so forth. So um, availability sets definitely a must have. Uh, I would look at it as HA um, in the context of your infrastructure planning.
Yeah, the way I like to think of an availability set, like going from like on-prem to, to, to Azure, is, is it's like it's the same, it's a similar concept as, you know, splitting VMs um, across multiple hosts, like for the hypervisor you have on-premise. Like for instance, you would want, you know, two storefront servers on the same Hyper-V host, for example, um, on-premise availability sets are the same concept within Azure. You're splitting it and you're kind of creating that hardware layer HA uh, within the data center. And then, um, so moving on to the next set of questions, it's actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna combine two because they're both really discussing cost. Um, cost covers Azure and Citrix licensing main support and also, you know, questions about storage consumption. So I think maybe to initially break down this, uh, this question, uh, Jeff, would you like to walk us through, I guess, some of the, the costs associated with Azure and then I can follow up with, um, you know, the Citrix licensing pieces and how that factors in. Sure. So, you know, with the, with the Azure costs, we're looking at compute for the virtual machine. Um, we're looking at resources like storage, how much storage is consumed, um, and the type of storage, uh, whether that be uh, premium disks, which I think you'll find a majority of the Citrix services are recommended that you use premium disks. Um, and so we break down that cost by looking at the runtime of the virtual machine and the amount of storage that's consumed. There's also, um, you know, think of this as, as, you know, the consumption model, right, as we get out of this model of, of, um, of capital expenditure and we're in this consumption model, so how long things run. I think a good example of how to control those Azure costs um, uh, is around the smart tools and uh, with smart scale, right, and being able to um, uh, bring down those VDAs when they're not being used. So that all encompassing uh, a point of view of Azure cost, when we, we look at some of the things that are kind of gotchas and, and watch out for is if you are using, uh, like an example would be the uh, in-series VMs inside of Azure, um, you are consuming a lot of egress bandwidth, right? You're sending um, uh, a lot of data uh, in that in, in that mode, right, with with the graphics uh, constraints and stuff. So there are a couple of examples where you definitely want to watch out for um, what you're looking at um, for your Azure costs across the network storage and compute. But for the most part, those are the big um, the big big uh, um, drivers of cost when it comes to Azure. Thanks, Jeff. And one of the other costs in thinking of like the end-to-end -end solution. So you have the Citrix licensing considerations from a Citrix cloud perspective. That would be you know user licensing from like a traditional Zen apps and desktop like you know platinum enterprise. That's something that can be you know user device or concurrent. Um, and as well as you know when you're planning out this solution, especially if you need to get into um, a cost conversation with your business, it's you know thinking of also things like you know Windows licensing, which with which Azure has from a server perspective, the hybrid use benefits. So you can leverage some of your on-premise server licenses and you know reduce some of your Azure costs, as well as you know factoring in licensing such as you know your your any sort of monitoring tools, things along those lines. Uh, but for for those of you who are interested in just gathering just you know an, an estimate of what you know an Azure cost would look like from a Citrix perspective. Uh, we do have a great uh, cost calculator that we've made in conjunction with Microsoft. It's uh, it's uh, costcalculator.azurewebsites.net. Um, you can go in and you can actually build estimates based on you know the deployment model of Citrix on Azure that you're following. And it's it's a great it's a great tool to kind of get a high level estimate of the Azure infrastructure costs for your Citrix deployment. So moving to the next question, uh, this one is from Sergey. Uh, how about using Storage Spaces Direct? Um, for user profiles, could you tell me a little bit more about this practice? You know, in, well, excuse me. How about using Storage Spaces Direct in conjunction with OneDrive mapping for user profiles? Is this a good practice? Uh, Jeff, would you like to kind of you know comment a little bit more about Storage Spaces? Yeah, sure. So Storage Spaces Direct, um, you know, is our our um, our storage um, technology, right? That starts with Windows Server 2016. Um, and it is a common practice to take, to use storage spaces direct, uh, deploy it on Azure to store uh, user profiles. Um, and typically what we'll do to, to uh, plan for the, the uh, storage for uh, user profiles is we'll use the RDS, uh, U, UPD profiles uh, chart uh, for our recommendations to kind of as, as a starting base. Um, but I think we'll have to take the OneDrive offline and do that as a follow-up. So, um, you know, just looking at uh, the storage spaces direct component of it, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's, that's, that's a primary model that we use um, uh, with, our, with our profiles. The, the OneDrive component of it, the OneDrive mapping, I think um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take that offline, uh, Sergey, and, uh, and we'll, we'll do a follow-up with you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. And then uh, moving on to the next uh, next question. Um, if you use Citrix NetScaler in the cloud, is two-factor authentication available? And this comes in from Alfred. Um, so when you're using NetScaler, so there are two forms of NetScalers, and especially um, Citrix Cloud provides the flexibility really to adopt either, either form. Uh, you have NetScaler Gateway as a service. This is where you have like ICA-based proxy of NetScaler, uh, and that ex actually exists in Citrix Cloud. So you really get that ICA proxy, you know, um, ICA going over, you know, SSL securely uh, for your end users uh, as part of the service, and you don't need to manage the overhead of the NetScaler. Uh, today, that's something that, um, I, with the workspace service, uh, Azure Active Directory is in preview. So you can leverage that NetScaler gateway as a service and utilize Azure Active Directory with um, two-factor authentication through Azure MFA uh, through that process. Um, again, it's in preview today, uh, something that our teams continue to work forward and move toward. But then when you use a, for instance, a NetScaler, standard NetScaler, like a NetScaler VPX, you can still configure Citrix Cloud to leverage that NetScaler that you have within your resource location. So for instance, spinning up a VPX within your Azure subscription, setting up any sort of two-factor authentication solution you have on-prem, uh, you can leverage Citrix Cloud. Um, a, a fairly common practice, especially as customers look towards transitioning from like that standard traditional 7.x Citrix licensing to the Citrix Cloud version of uh, the product is, for instance, you know, using that as a transition. So you have your access layer on premise, your storefront servers, your NetScaler. Customers are currently accessing and utilizing those technologies to authenticate. Uh, with storefront, you can actually take the cloud connectors. So when you start uh, deploying Citrix Cloud, you can list those as another set of delivery controllers uh, within the storefront servers that you're leveraging today. So for instance, you can start transitioning people from your on-premise traditional Citrix into Citrix Cloud, same way that you would aggregate uh, workloads when going from a 6.5 to 7.x migration using Storefront. Uh, so definitely something worth looking into. But um, again, Alfred, and I guess in the short answer, uh, yes, there is two-factor available uh, utilizing Citrix NetScaler. There's the form factor of how you use NetScaler depends on your requirements. And then a uh, next question comes in from uh, Jamie. Uh, can you explain exactly what Express Route is? Uh, Jeff, would you like to uh, dive into that one? Yeah, Express Route is, a, is an Azure service that lets you create a private connection between Microsoft data centers and infrastructure on premise or a data center that the customer owns. Um, so the benefit here is that you don't have to go over to public internet for the connectivity. Um, you have higher security and re reliability. So if we look at enterprise networks, typical latency we expect to see is below 13 milliseconds. Um, so, uh, so for those sen sensitive uh, um, scale outs that we have to do in connecting with a data center, Express Route is our main uh, connectivity option there. There's two ways that you can consume it. Uh, you can consume it based upon the amount of data that you use that, that traverses the line, um, or you can buy an all-out consumption like uh, an unlimited use for a type of connection. So um, Express Route is the way that we connect uh, Azure to uh, a customer's uh, co-located or, or data center on-premise. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. And then moving to the next question, um, and this comes from Roy. Uh, you mentioned training for Citrix on Azure. Where can I find this? Um, so Roy, on training.citrix.com, we actually have uh, two courses um, for Citrix Cloud, and then one as well as specifically uh, working with Citrix on Azure. Uh, I believe it's CXD 250 and 251. Um, please, uh, please don't call me on that. But definitely go to training.citrix.com, and you can actually go into the search and search Azure. And then you'd be able to access the courses that we have um, that we, again, worked with Microsoft and jointly developed. Um, it's a two-day course, and it really dives into a lot of what we discussed um, on this webinar today, you know, understanding the core Azure practices that are going to make you successful from a Citrix perspective, understanding the basics of managing the ZenApp as a desktop solution. Uh, so definitely recommended for, you know, as you're looking towards um, adopting Citrix Cloud and you want to train your administration team, uh, training.citrix.com is a great way to start if you want to look at the existing training offerings we've developed. So next question is, is from Abdul. SQL database is managed by Azure or by Citrix? So from the Citrix Cloud perspective, and this is one of the great advantages of, you know, shifting from, you know, that traditional 7.x model where you're managing the end-to-end -end solution into a Citrix Cloud, especially leveraging, you know, of Microsoft Azure, 
is from a Citrix perspective, that control plane, um, your delivery controllers, your director, your license server, your SQL database, with Citrix Cloud, that's all controlled and managed by Citrix. Um, so, for instance, you know, any sort of SQL maintenance or SQL licensing, uh, that site database, modern database, config logging database, that's all consumed as part of the service. So your team no longer has to maintain uh, those pieces. That is maintained by Citrix. And then from an Azure perspective, especially with, you know, infrastructure as a service, you know, managing the, the underlying hypervisor, worrying about going through and, you know, I need to go do this cost exercise because I need to make, I mean, this sizing exercise because I need to make a capital expense of hardware and purchase all this network rack data, uh, rack servers and uh, purchase, you know, data center power. Uh, that's all, you know, included as part of that Azure IaaS offering. You can really maintain and utilize that elastic scale and um, scalability and consumption of the Azure model. Uh, so Abdul, definitely something worth looking into if your your organization is really looking to shift from a, you know, I like to say like the monotony of systems management into more of a solution provider within your organization. Uh, by offloading some of these concepts, it really allows your Citrix team to focus a lot more on driving value for the business, focusing on use cases, adopting, you know, the Citrix solution into ways that it can continue to drive value within your organization. Um, let's go to, I think there's a, a great one here about the Azure load balancer. Uh, I'm considering Netscaler uh, HA within Azure. Wouldn't the Azure load balancer be a single point of failure? Um, Jeff, could you maybe provide a little bit more background on um, the Azure load balancer? Sure. So the, load, the Azure load balancer service has, has a basic and a standard edition. Um, and our Azure load balancer is going to match the SLA of the VMs uh, that it's connected to. So in an availability set to be 99.95 um, would be your availability of that service. So um, we uh, build the, the load balancer set to be highly available and a highly available service that matches our, our VMs. Um, there are ways to which, you know, <laughs> You, you probably would not want to stack load balancers, but um, we can do multi-region or uh, multi-single region deployments uh, to get a little bit more availability there if that's required. But the load balancer is, is, is just a, a typical, uh, you know, layer four load balancer. It's hash-based distribution. Um, and, uh, and if you go to the standard, our standard load balancer, which is, uh, you know, up from the basic, um, has like in a truly enterprise scale uh, to be used with like a thousand VMs or, uh, you know, at a really large scale, right? Um, so, so that's how the Azure load balancer works in the way the SLA applies to it. And then also kind of getting into that, that Azure load balancing, old Citrix load balancing. You know, Azure load balancer is a way that, you know, like Jeff mentioned, can really direct traffic and, you know, you can scale out your net scalers in an active active capacity, especially since clustering is not available within Azure. But from a, a net scaler perspective, you know, the net scaler you're driving, you know, that, you know, that those layer seven monitors, you know, the storefront services, being able to monitor X, XML within your Citrix environment. Um, a lot more advanced features and, and different versions of persistence uh, that you can apply to the Citrix environment, um, as well as the, you know, the smart access, the IPA proxy, you know, AAA, auth uh, AAA authentication, you know, security, denial of service. So the NetScaler itself goes beyond just load balancing. Um, so even though we consume the Azure load balancer um, to, you know, scale out the NetScaler and drive some of the active passive or HA configuration, uh, you know, working in tandem and utilizing both those technologies is really the key to you know, driving, you know, highly available, you know, monitoring all those inter integrated services between your uh, Citrix infrastructure to really drive, you know, that Citrix leading practices environment. Let's go to the next question. And this will probably be the last one because I think we're, we're running over. In Azure, while using app layering before publishing an MCS catalog, we have to create an image from Azure Storage. Uh, okay, so that's um, so talking about Azure and, and Citrix app layering um, and leveraging uh, Citrix app layering with uh, with Azure. So, for instance, especially when you're you leveraging MCS, uh, when you provision the Azure connector uh, for um, for app layering, uh, what's going to occur is you know it's going to provision out that VHD uh, for uh, for your um, for your overall image. Now, uh, before you can leverage it with MCS, um, since it's provisioning out the VHD and it's going to be sysprep, you need to start up that image to get through that initial sysprep, and then you can add it to your MCS catalog. But thinking of app layering, especially when you start migrating towards 
um, Azure with uh, with Citrix, especially going from on-prem uh, into that you know that that public cloud, is it really allows you to kind of consolidate your your image management across multiple hypervisors. So, for instance, if you're moving say from you know Hyper-V on-prem, present server VMware, and then shifting into Azure, you can create a separate platform layer for each of those hypervisor configurations with you know your primary hypervisor uh, configuration existing in the OS layer. So, for instance, you know. On premise, I'm going to say, you know, say I'm going to package my applications on premise utilizing Zen Server. Um, this is going to be where I exist today. I'm transitioning into Azure. My OS layer, since I'm doing most of my packaging, that's the lowest priority layer when it comes to Citrix app layering. So any of my apps I'm packaging, I'm packaging, say, on prem. But if I were to create, say, a platform layer for Azure, that would actually, the, the app layering actually has the ability to extract those Zen Server tools. And when you create that platform layer for Azure, you can add, you know, the Azure VM agent, any specific configurations uh, from a platform perspective, you know, remove tools like uh, PBS, for instance. And then you can consolidate and manage the same OS and all the same applications, but then shift platforms all from one centralized point of management. So instead of having to manage, you know, 2x layers for each different hyper hypervisor as you're moving to hybrid cloud, you can consolidate that into a single tool and a single technology. And actually, a couple of uh, people requested the URL for the calculator again. Um, it's costcalculator.azurewebsite.net. And I'll just to kind of highlight back to the you know, so those cost considerations from an Azure perspective that Jeff was mentioning before around compute network and storage. On costcalculator.azurewebsite.net, it's a Citrix-based calculator that allows you to, you know, input the information that you project for your Citrix environment within Azure, and it'll give you an estimate of the Azure uh, infrastructure cost that would be associated with that environment. Again, this is the Azure infrastructure cost. Um, your organization would definitely need to consider, you know, additional costs from like a, a licensing perspective, as well as any like sort of monitoring agents you have in your environment. But it's a great way to go about, you know, providing an initial estimate as you start planning for that cloud transition. And I think this will be the the, the last uh, the last question that we'll have to cover because I know we're running a little bit over. Um, is there a preferred migration plan to Citrix Cloud? Um, and this comes from Anthony. Uh, so going from you know on-premise Citrix to to Citrix Cloud, um, I know I highlighted this earlier. Citrix Cloud, there are the cloud-based versions of of storefront and NetScale, or like I mentioned with the NetScaler gateway with service, as well as um, we have the workspace service for Citrix. Um, so these act as you know that cloud access layer um, for your infrastructure. But the great thing about the Zen apps and desktop service within Citrix Cloud is you have the flexibility to leverage you know an on-prem access layer as well as what what exists within the cloud. It's not all or nothing. Um, so that investment you've made in, you know, transitioning from, say, web interface to storefront or setting up NetScaler and integrating an on-premise two-factor authentication solution, uh, you don't need to tear that out immediately as you start transitioning into Citrix Cloud. So aggregating, for instance, your on-prem environment with your Citrix Cloud environment through storefront is a great way to make that transition over time in a way that's not going to dis disjoint and rapidly change the user experience. So very similar to how you approached Anthony, like a 6.5 migration, um, going from 6.5 to, you know, say like, say, you know, 7.x, using storefront to aggregate your old 6.5, you know, farm with your new 7.x site, and then slowly transitioning users from, you know, an app perspective by either, you know, taking that user group that's, you know, published to, you know, Office, and, you know, enabling it on 7.x or creating new active directory groups for, you know, your old Citrix environment as well as your new Citrix environment to then shift and then shift to an active that same process that you followed for 6.5 by leveraging storefront and making that transition in parallel it would be very similar with Citrix Cloud, except on the Citrix Cloud standpoint, you're not building that core infrastructure. You're really just setting up those cloud connectors, installing the VDAs, and then you can start making that uh, transition by having those VDAs register uh, to those cloud connectors. So if you're actually going from 7.x to Citrix Cloud, not 6.5 to Citrix Cloud, you would just update the VDAs once you have those cloud connectors. You can update the, the associated BDAs, have them register with the cloud connectors, and then create the catalog or delivery or you know delivery group within Citrix Cloud, and then those workloads will now be managed by Citrix Cloud. Um, so the migration there is a you know a, a well-defined migration path, and it really starts with leveraging you know again similar to what, what the same process you used if you've been through a 6.5 to 7.x migration. 
Excellent. And uh, Jeff, uh, thank you again uh, for joining us today. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining the call and, and going through these little lessons learned and leading practice with us. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, we'll, any questions that we weren't able to get to today, uh, Jeff and I are going to put together a follow-up log to kind of answer some of the key points and key takeaways from the webinar. But thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, Kevin, Jeff, thank you both. That was fantastic. I think we'll have to have you back very soon. Um, I'm not sure that we even scratched the surface on these questions, which is great. So as Kevin mentioned, certainly check out the blog. We'll get to all of the questions that were submitted through that medium. Um, just a point of clarity, the training that we mentioned during the webinar was CXD 251 and 252. Both of those are available at training.citrix.com. And I can see there are some more questions about the recording and the slides. Again, those are all available through the link that you use to access the event today. Um, this event and all of the other uh, webinars from the TIP series are also available at bit.ly slash Citrix Tips. Um, Kevin did a great cloud webinar back in October. Um, we've also got an app layering event that was super popular. So be sure to check out that link if um, you have any other questions. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you again in March, and we appreciate your time today. Have a great one.